Hello and welcome to this episode of Better Life Today. I'm Doug Garcia and with me today is a special guest, Sherry McEwen. Sherry, welcome. Hi. How are you doing today? Great, thanks. <laughs> we kind of put you on the spot, didn't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the reason that Sherry is with me today is that in an episode before that I've uh, recorded with your daughter, Rebecca Hill, and Rebecca was with us and she was kind enough to share her personal testimony of how she dealt with the, the issue of when she found out she had cancer. It happened this year, and all of a sudden she finds out, she gets a call or whatever, you've got cancer and it's serious. And Rebecca shared a wonderful testimony. If you haven't seen it, make sure you go back and watch it, the Rebecca Hill testimony. How you deal with God, you know, when, when you, how do you, what do you do with God when you have cancer? How do, how do you go to him for help is what I mean to say. Mm -hmm. And um, that means that mom has been nearby. And so you've been in town and we had a chance to talk. And as we talked, I said, you know, I think our audience should hear some of the things that you were saying behind the scenes. So why don't you start out by telling me, well, first, before we do that, let's, there's a Bible verse that I chose that I thought was appropriate for today. Yeah. And this is found in Hebrews 4, 16. And it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. And I hope we can talk about two topics today. They're not necessarily connected, but both of them require God's grace and help. Amen. The first one I'd like to talk to you about is what do you do when you find out your child has a serious illness? That's topic number one. And later, as we have time, I would like to talk about a second topic that you let me in on, and that is how you're dealing with the young people in your church. And there's a lot of people out there who have young people in their church, and sometimes you throw up your hands and go, what do I do with them? How can I, how can I help them learn of the Lord? They seem to have their own lives and their own interests. Yeah. But you, some amazing things happened in your church, and I wanted you to share that with our audience. But let's get back to the first topic. What do you do when you find out that your child has a serious illness? What did you do? Well, the very first thing was just to pray. Um, you know, God promises that he's an ever-present help in times of trouble and that we don't need to be afraid. And um, I remember uh, Rebecca you know, calling to let me know about this ultrasound. It was the second one she'd had in a couple months. Um, and that it looked like um, this mass had gotten larger and developed its own blood supply. Mm. So I'm a nurse, and um, I immediately felt like the, this was an indication that it was a malignancy. So she had called to let me know that they needed a needle biopsy of the breast, and she said they wouldn't be able to do it for X number of days. It was quite a while, but then they had called and moved it up to just a few days after this call. So we began to pray, and um, a lot of times, you know, the thought comes to you to pray that this is not cancer. You know, when she was eight years old, uh, she had appendicitis, and she, there was a point where, you know, she was just sick to her stomach and so forth, but there was a point where she stood up and she doubled over, and she couldn't straighten back up again, and I wanted to say, oh, Lord, please don't let this be her appendix. She's eight years old. Mm. But I had this thought that I think the Lord gave me, don't pray for it not to be that. Just pray for the strength to go through. And that the same thing happened with the cancer, you know, um, you know, we could ask for it not to be cancer, but it was like just that voice saying, you just ask me to help you go through this. And that's what he's done. Um, he is an ever-present help in trouble. And one thing about the Lord, you know, the Bible is full of promises, so many promises. And sometimes I read a verse that I've read 50 times before, and I haven't seen a promise in it, but when I need it, I see the promise there. I don't know if that's happened to you, but... Um, but I know that, um, that verse in Psalm 46, one and two, that, you know, he's an ever present help in trouble and we don't need to be afraid no matter what happens. If the 
earthquakes or the mountains are moved to the midst of the sea, we don't need to be afraid. And also Romans 8, 28, that he will make all things work together for good to those who love him. Yes. So that was our, that was my prayer to start out with, that he would um, just make this work together for good and show us how to have courage and to be strong and to be cheerful and to seek what he would have us seek through this experience. Some people say, you know, I become a Christian. I shouldn't, nothing bad should ever happen to me. And I take a, a comfort, and it's unusual to say that, but it's a comfort when Jesus said, um, in this world you will have tribulation, yeah. but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. That's right. So he said, you know, in this world there's going to be tribulation, mm -hmm. even for my people, mm -hmm. but I'm with you. You know, when he left his disciples, he said, lo, I'm with you, even to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. And we can trust God that, you know, we have difficult times uh, on this earth. Our time on earth may be 10 years, 20, 30, 80, mm -hmm. uh, and then eternity. So it's a very short time That's by right. comparison. That's right. So in this short time that we're given, we can rely on the Lord to get us through whatever difficulties may present themselves yeah. before we get to eternity. That's right. And, and what about the rest of your family? How, how did this impact them? Well, it was... I think unbelievable for everybody, you know, um, of all the people in our family that we can think of, Rebecca would be the least likely one to have cancer, you mm. know, she's very health conscious and um, in a lot of ways. Uh, so it was, every time we got a test result, it seemed like it was a result from somebody else, like we just had the wrong name on the wrong report, you know. Um, immediately, you know, uh, after the breast biopsy, the needle biopsy, they have this nice little thing called my chart. So before the doctor even tells you what's wrong, you have these results come up on your screen. So uh, we knew before she had uh, gone back for the appointment for the results, we knew what the results were. And, you know, that first uh, result that it was cancer um, was hard. And you're trying to work through words like invasive ductal car carcinoma and like um, what all does that mean? And then you hear things like, um, uh, you know, slow growing and um, one of the better ones to try to take care of. And you hear things like that and you think, oh, that's good, you know. But uh, about the, probably the second time I talked to Rebecca after she told me about the needle biopsy, I said, well, how are you doing? And um, how are you feeling? And she said, well, I'm feeling nauseated because I have to keep taking, um, eating cough drops to stop my cough so that I can continue with my day at work. And I said, you mean that little cough that keeps breaking through? She said, yeah, I have allergies. And right away I thought, that's not allergies. And I have had two friends, and I thought, I've heard that cough before. And both of those friends died within a month after their diagnosis. And um, then I said, well, are you sleeping well? And she said, you know, well, except for the cough wakes me up, and then this pain in my hip wakes me up. And I said, the, what pain in your hip? And so I started thinking about people I knew with breast cancer that had metastasis to the bones. Mm -hmm. So right away, before she had scans done, it was in my mind that she had metastasis to her lungs and to her bones. And I thought, how could it be? And again, I want to say, Lord, please don't let this be. I, I tried to, you know, talk myself out of it. My husband would say, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. You know, it's not, it's not that. And um, then when we got the test results back, it's not only in her bones, but like skull and spine and ribs and thighs and pelvis and you're just like going how how does she have breast cancer that's stage four and she hasn't been sick yeah. you know so it all of us it, it hit us so hard I, I drove to Ohio to be with my mom and my um, stepdad when Rebecca was going to tell them because I knew it was going to be hard and that's just how it was for everybody it was just um, out of the blue totally unbelievable mm -hmm. and every scan or MRI or whatever that came back looked like it should belong to somebody else. Is there something that you can point to that you've learned along the way up to this point? Because we're not, the story's not done. No. She just finished treatments and now she's on some minor treatments and, yeah, she's and she has tests coming up next month. Mm -hmm. Have you learned something to this point that you would could share? Well, you know, we're never alone in the darkness. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, um, Things are just dark, and you don't see any light, but we aren't alone. And the Bible says 
that even the darkness is light to God. Um, so that continual presence, and I've learned that I just have to praise him in the midst of the storm because he's promised to never leave us or forsake us. Just like you said, we have him with us always, and his promises are true. He doesn't lie. He doesn't make mistakes, and he is sovereign. He sees things from eternity, and he has a plan. So um, I have just learned that in the dark nights, in the um, good times, you know, it helps me to praise him. He does something supernatural when I praise him. He inhabits the praise of his people, it says in Psalm 22, 3. And so somehow he gives us strength and courage if we continue to trust him. How to trust him? I mean, you know, there isn't anybody else. So um, no matter how dark it looks, no matter how bad the results look, it's about him and it's about trusting him and he and he gives us the strength to endure. In the Bible, we see again and again, uh, God has helped his people through difficult times. Uh, yes. A lot of people, a lot of Christians, before Christians, God's people, they all had troubles. Yes. And the Lord helped them in various ways. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the help came in the Red Sea experience where he'll do miraculous yes. things to part the Red Sea. And other times, it's endurance. It's grace to, to put up with it. For the short time that we're mm -hmm. here, it can go either way. That's right. Now, this happened to your daughter the beginning of 2021. Mm -hmm. We are now recording this program December of 2021. Yes. We don't know the end of the story at this point, but I can invite our friends in the audience to please join us in prayer Thank for you. your daughter. Thank you. That God's will is done. And if his Amen. will includes miraculous healing, we welcome it with open arms. Amen. Uh, Amen. If his will is something else, we know that he has great power to give us endurance, and the ability to, to go through a, a trial. That's right. Because at the other end, regardless of what the ending will be, um, somebody has once said, we're all terminal. That's Where right. we, when we pass, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And we all want to end up on the other side in God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Whether that happens tomorrow, whether that happens 30 years from now, the goal is the same for all of us. We want to be in God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing that um, there was a Friday night with, within just a week or so after um, the diagnosis and I was like trying to go through like the Sabbath school preparations for the youth class and uh, it just all of a sudden hit me out of nowhere and I just started crying and crying and I had to go to my knees and I said, mm -hmm. God, you didn't bring Rebecca through all these other things to let her just die, did you? you, you are you just going to let her die now? You know, and I was, ha it was like hours of just struggle with the Lord because it just hit me so hard and I couldn't finish what I was doing. Um, but in the morning, within just a few hours, I didn't sleep much, but um, the Lord said to me in my mind, that impression and thought came to me that he said it was no harder for Jesus to raise Lazarus back to life when he was in the grave four days. And as the Bible says, he stinketh. <laughs> um, then it would have been for him to heal him before he died. So it is no harder for me to heal Rebecca when she has stage four cancer than it would be for me to heal her when she has a cold. There are no limits to God. His wisdom decides. If we put our lives into His hands, His wisdom will decide for us. Amen. We need to take a short break. Folks, stay with us. There's more to talk about, and we'll be right back after this. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer-supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello and welcome back to Better Life Today. I've been talking to my special guest, Sherry McEwen. Sherry, you are the mom of Rebecca Hill. And we have been talking about Rebecca's diagnosis with aggressive cancer and how it impacted you and your family. We've already talked to Rebecca and she's yeah. told us how she's put her life into God's hands and saying, Lord, here I am. Amen. And then you just shared with us about how it impacted you and how you went back and forth with the Lord. Don't let it be this. And then the Lord would say, I can take care of it. I can take That's care of right. it. That's right. You had a thought you wanted to end with before we switch topics. So what was that? Well, I'd just like to share Psalm 28, 6 and 7. It's um, one of my favorite um, Bible passages. It says, Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. 
The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. And I like that because the psalmist has said that um, he has placed his supplications before the Lord, and in the, in the present tense, he says, and I am helped. So it's like we've spoken it to the Lord. We can trust that now, before we see the answer, we are being helped. And then the end of the verse says, with my song, I will praise him because he's my strength and my shield. And that really says it all, that when we put it before the Lord, we can trust that we're being helped now. He's answering before we've called. He'll help provide. And so we can just praise him. So. And we can be confident of his love. I tell people on the phone sometimes when they call in and they might question God's love. And I said, hold on. Jesus told us again and again, God loves you. He knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He knows what you need. He sees a sparrow fall. You are much more important than a sparrow. And Jesus just went on and on. We cannot doubt his love because Jesus cannot lie. Absolutely. If Jesus says God loves you, he loves you. That's right. And he will do the right thing for us in the end. That's right. Yeah. Now, some of our friends in the audience may want to write to you or your daughter. And your daughter has a special email account set up that she can receive messages. So that email address, friends, is a walking miracle. 2021 at gmail.com. Right. A walking miracle 2021 at gmail.com. And I would encourage you, sit down. Write Rebecca a note of encouragement. Say, we've heard about your story. We know you're, you're um, praying for a miracle, and we're going to pray with you. Let her know what you're doing. Thank and you. uh, hopefully you've been encouraged by her ability to put her life in God's hands. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, God be with you and your family Thank you. as you continue down this road. Thank you. There was another thing that we talked about one day <laughs> that I also wanted to share with the audience, and we're kind of going to change gears now. This is a different topic altogether, but it still involves children. I suppose some of the people in our audience might be church, um, school. Uh, when I say school, I mean the church, like Sunday mm -hmm. school, Sabbath mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. uh, teachers, and you have the youth, and maybe they're, you're given the youth or somebody asks you to be a part of the youth and you say, what in the world do I do with these young people? <laughs> Whether they're early teens, uh, junior age, early teens or youth, uh, sometimes it can be a real challenge. Today they have their phones and they're entertained all the time. And then they come into church. So what do you want to do with them? Now you had a situation happen at your church and you were telling me the story. And I would wonder if you would share that story with our audience. Sure. What happened with you guys? <laughs> well, in our church, um, we have... a department with junior early teen, which is about age 12 to um, should be probably about 15, 16, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but we have a broader range than that now. Um, and they had a Sabbath school teacher who needed to um, stop teaching for various reasons. And at the same time, um, right about the same time, the pianist, who they all love, some of them took piano lessons from, she died of a stroke. Very Suddenly, she had the stroke, and a few days later, she died very unexpectedly. And then they had another teacher who took the place after that, um, and she died of lung cancer, breast cancer with metastasis to the lungs. And that was very sudden. That was within maybe a month or so mm -hmm. after she got sick. And so the kids were in need of a Sabbath school teacher, and they had had a lot of loss. Those three um, losses were not really easy for them. They loved those um, teachers significantly. And uh, yet we had a hard time replacing the teachers. Um, we would pray that, you know, the Lord would provide somebody. And I particularly was praying for a teacher because a lot of times they would call at the last minute and ask me to step in. And it, they weren't an easy group of kids at first, but, um, but, there was a need there, and I would say, Lord, please give them somebody who loves them. They need somebody who loves them and will stay and be long-term, And uh, but not me. I was already helping with the young adults, and the young adults are you know, easy. You just don't have to do, <laughs> you just study the lesson, and you can have dialogue, and you don't have to you know, do a lot of special things to get their attention or whatever. So months went by, and... Um, Finally, I was praying, and I felt like the Lord was saying, I need you to be willing. So I was horrified, but I said, Lord, it's not me, is it? And I said, but if, if you want me to do this, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. But I really didn't want him to want me to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to the Sabbath school council and asked them, you know, told them I'm, I'm willing to 
go ahead and take the junior teen department if you need me to. And they kind of surprised me. They said, well, well, that'll be okay until we find somebody. And I went from there to prayer meeting thinking to myself, well, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe there's a reason they don't want me to be. And that's okay, Lord. That's all right. But I just thought everybody would be so relieved because every week we were trying to find somebody. And um, so I knelt down for prayer and I was taking it to the Lord while prayer meeting was going on. And uh, when we finished our prayer, uh, one of the kids was sitting next to me and telling me, Miss Sherry, you have a note in the lobby. Did you see it? And I said, shh, we'll get it afterward. And one of the other kids said, did you see the envelope in the lobby with your name on it? And I said, shh. And so then one little girl came in and she said, Miss Sherry, this is for you. And she put the note on my lap and the other kids said, open it. And I said, no, we're having a prayer meeting. <laughs> and so after prayer meeting, they were so eager. And I, it was um, written with pencil and my, my name on the front in a child's handwriting. And um, uh, so I opened it afterward and it said, Miss Sherry, we really want you to be our teacher for Sabbath school. Oh. We have been praying about it. And it was signed all the kids who were in the Sabbath school class. And so as prayer meeting started and I was saying, Lord, I don't understand and I don't know what your answer is to the problem, but I think it's not me because the, you know, committee wasn't like jumping up and down. And then I got that letter, you know, from the kids and that was like the Lord telling me, yes, I do want you to do this. And they had worked on that letter for a while to get the signatures of all of their classmates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the start of, and that I think was about four years ago, the start of um, being in the junior early teen class instead of the young adults. And, wow. uh, so have you worked with them up until your daughter got sick? Were you working with them? Yes, yes. Um, I have other people who help, but um, we just have a fabulous group of young people at our church um, in Tennessee, and they are they're on fire for the Lord. So well, let me ask you first, what lessons do you use for that kind of an age group? What kind of studies... Could you find that they might find interesting? Well, we were we, we were using um, a, a program to start out with, and one of the moms came and said, you know, isn't there something that will help them learn to study the Bible better, something that will, you know, um, like they were interested in the Young Disciple program, and in the Young Disciple magazine, um, it has a lesson study that is very um, thorough and helpful in teaching principles of Bible study besides the actual lesson. Uh, and also in the Young Disciple magazine, they have um, missionary stories like continuing true stories. And the information is, um, it just seems to be something that the kids are looking for. So you started using this Young so Disciple program? So we started program? using the Young Disciple program. That wasn't easy because change in a lot of times in churches or wherever change doesn't happen easily. So we had to have a special committee meeting, um, but I took some concerns uh, to the committee um, about the program we were using and about the program I was asking if we could use. And by the time we finished our meeting um, and the kids were on their knees praying, we had like 100% um, enthusiasm for the Young Disciple program and making a change. In fact, they said, we want you to start this right away. So that's the program we changed to, and that was probably within four months or so after I started working with the kids, maybe earlier than that. But um, Now, somebody may want to find out what that program's all about. So at this point, I'm going to go later on, mm -hmm. look up what that address is, and put it on the screen now so that the audience can go on the web okay. and learn more about the Young Disciple program that's great. that you found was very that's good for your great. kids. Okay. Yeah, it was very helpful. It's very helpful as a teacher, and I'm not like a natural teacher. I, I'm a great one-on-one -on -one to talk with the kids and stuff, but um, I'm not very creative on my own. And so uh, when I started that program, they have a lot of teacher helps and very interesting approaches, some things about nature, about history, science. Um, it's very interesting for the young people. Oh, and so it gave me what I needed to kind of jump in and do a better job. Now our time is going away quickly here, but I wanted you to share about what is this I've heard about Bible studies programs with the kids or something. What, what, what are you doing with that? Oh, well, we um, in the summer, um, we, the Lord gave this idea to, to our head elder to have a youth canvassing program. What, can you explain to our audience what that means? <laughs> so that means um, for three weeks, the young people 
Um, they receive training from someone who um, does this kind of evangelism, door-to-door -door evangelism, and um, they receive training in the morning, and then in the afternoon we would take them out, and they'd go door-to-door, -door, and they had books to sell, books like recipe books, books to improve your health, books about um, the controversy between Christ and Satan, and um, books about Jesus being the desire of all ages, and so they would go door-to-door -door and tell the um, people whose door they were knocking on, that they were um, trying to raise money for a certain goal. They were told that they needed to choose a goal that was uh, worthy and stick to that. So some of them were trying to raise money for musical instruments for the youth orchestra that they have at our church. Mm -hmm. um, some were trying to raise money to go to um, the Young Disciple Camp. Sometimes they were raising money for a mission trip. So they would just tell that to the people whose door they knocked on, and then for three weeks they learned to go and uh, distribute books in this way. That sounds like a hard thing to get a young person to do. How did they accept it? They loved it. And really? we ha if they were over 16, they could go on their own from house to house. We had four that were over 16, I think, four or five. All the rest of them, like 12 or more, were from 10 years old to 16 years old. And they went two by two, and we had, of course, moms you know, dropping them off, and um, we all had training, but they they loved it, and they raised a lot of money, mm -hmm. and they got a lot of books out. Um, for our youth orchestra, they were able to buy uh, double bass <laughs> and, and then um, put some money also toward uh, part of the timpani. So. Wow. Well, our time has already run out. I can't believe it. We, I know. But, it, but friends, if you're interested in, in knowing what this program is, I would suggest you look up that website or use the email we just gave to write a letter, a note, and find out some details if you want to know more about this. But it's, thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing what has been on your heart, both for your daughter and for the young people of your church. Thank you for having me. And friends, we hope you stay with us and watch further episodes of Better Life Today, and where we bring you more interviews like this, trying to encourage you to follow the Lord and stay true to the end so that we can enter the kingdom together. Amen. We'll see you next time.